has his background in solid state physics, biophysics and spectroscopy. As a professor of physics at the University of Bremen, he started caving during the late 70s due to the political turmoil at the university. Caving raised his awareness in car science. He soon realized that the quantitative approach of a physicist could open more new insights into a, uh, into a that time relatively descriptive field of research. Since then, he opened many in a broad spectrum of topics from dissolution and precipitation kinetics of carbonates and dissolution kinetics of gypsum to spelotem growth and mechanisms of uh, isotope fractionation in spelotems both by the theoretical models and by laboratory experiments, as well as field work in calcite depositing stream in Germany, China and Italy. For Karl's hydrology, the most important is his pioneering approach in modeling spellogenesis. Knowledge on the evolution of karst aquifers is crucial for understanding their complex structure and flow and transfer within. He has been contributed to these topics for the last 30 years, starting in the 80s and so far the last paper appearing in 2019. This is his story. So, Wolfgang, you were raised and educated in post-war Germany. Can you tell us something about that time, your education and your early career? Yeah, well I was born in East Germany in the Erzgebirge. And as a child, I always was interested in rocks. And there are outcrops of basaltic rocks with huge piles of boulders. And you could crawl below them, you could go into little canyons. And that's where I had my interest in this kind of nature. We were free. After the war, our parents were engaged in surviving. And we had everything of freedom. Okay. Also, we had hunger. And later on, I studied in Frankfurt physics. I did my diploma there, I did my uh, PhD there in solid state physics, actually at that time in LK the Highlights. And um, I stayed uh, in Frankfurt for about, after my PhD, for about three years. And then, for some reasons, I moved to the United States, to MIT, where I did um, solid state physics, semiconductor physics with high magnetic fields. From there I went to the Max Planck Institute. In, where was it? Uh, this was in Stuttgart, in Stuttgart? Okay. for solid state physics. I had a permanent position there at the end, mm -hmm. in a leading position, but in a way I always was engaged in the political issues. And uh, I was actually in between the fronts. And if you are in between the fronts, you easily being put into one or the other drawers, mm -hmm. even you are a right wing or left wing. Yeah. So in Stuttgart I was a left wing because I went to the Betriebsrat, which is a kind of a shop for the employees mm -hmm. to present their interests. And the professor, I mean, this is something which is established by law, but the professors did not accept it. So there were conflicts and I knew I could not stay there. And at that time, there was a University of Bremen, which was a reform university, and I was a little bit naive and blue-eyed, as one says in Germany, uh, and I thought this would be a good place to go to. There I applied, and I was accepted, and I went there, and after half a year, actually, I found myself not any more in the left wing draw, but I was now in the right wing uh, draw. So the situation and I didn't worse. That, I didn't yeah. change my, my, my thinking at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, got me in a very bad situation because in Bremen continuously for about one month. Okay. And this was a very bad situation. I also was in Crimea. I was only the only one who said no. Who interrupted them? The students? Hmm? The lectures were interrupted by the students? Yeah. Okay. yeah, by radical students, okay. and uh, there was competition, there were two lectures, there was a lecture from the left wing side, Jens Scher and those people, and the, there you, you didn't, they didn't ask for anything, and I had a traditional lecture where people had to work, okay. and still I succeeded in getting about half of the students. They also were uh, disrupted. It was a very bad time, it was bashing, and this put me into a mental uh, situation where I needed some kind of relief. So I went uh, with my wife, actually, we went to the Hartz, and there we found the Jettenhöhle. 
which is gypsum, uh, yeah. gypsum cave, mm -hmm. and we went in there. Uh, well, okay, but uh, I went also to caves already with my son when I was in Stuttgart at the Schwäbisch. I had mostly show caves, but the one which we did, which was a white one, was the Feigensteiner Höhle. We went there in until the first siphon. He was six years old there. That's an active river cave. That's an active in river South cave. South Germany. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the hut, we were at the outside of the cave and there was a young boy and his father. They had those caving suits which we had at that time. So it's Pakas, Panzer Kampfanzüge. From the military, yeah. Which, yeah, were, yeah. Used, which were used by the military. Right, right. And uh, we talked to them, and then my wife said, Okay, Wolfgang, is this not something what you should do? Okay. And yeah. probably she thinks she never should have said that because <laughs> this uh, gave her a lot of weekends where she was alone, afraid that some accident could happen to us. And then I started to do that. I started in the Hearts and I started in the Sauerland. Yep. Okay. You were a physicist engaged in ESR, solid state physics. Later you moved to MIT, you were at Max Planck Institute, and uh, you did uh, research in Raman spectroscopy on hemoglobin and porphyrin at the Berman University. We know all these topics are really far away from car science, neither to say that the Bremen is also far away from being a karst area. So how did you start, you know, what raised your awareness on caves and cars? How did you start science in cars? Yeah, you know, I was telling you, I started to do caving and then I saw all this fantastic world of caves in a way I wanted to know how can all this arise? And uh, I had read some books and I knew everything was descriptive. And I said, look, all this in a way is physics. And it should not be too difficult physics. That's why I tried to go in there. And the other reason was actually uh, I had the equipment for Roman spectroscopy in Bremen, but I didn't have any people. And there was, at that time, research was not possible. And nobody was asked to do publications. This was capitalistic nonsense. Mm -hmm. So I had to do something which I could do by myself. And I started to look at that. And I was reading books. And especially there was the books of Franke, okay. uh, where the first was just caving, adventure of caving expeditions. This was a German textbook. This was a German uh, yeah. textbook. Mm -hmm. And this I just was reading to see what the world of caves is from the mantle way. And in the second book with Berkeley, together, they started to discuss also cave science and paleology. Mm -hmm. And there are a few chapters where they talk about mixing corrosion, and another chapter is where Franke had started to talk about uh, the growth of stalagmites. So then your contributions started. That's How did the community accept you? Yeah, yeah first I mean, I said, okay, this is physics, and I started to work on that. And in a rather short time, I did uh, four papers. Two on stalagmites, I used the literature of um, dissolution kinetics, uh, precipitation kinetics from Reddy and Nanculas, and used this growth rate in a way to find out the principle and the velocity of stalagmite growth. And another one, I used this. Uh, this this concept of mixing corrosion mm -hmm. to, to, to explain how caves could evolve on the crossroad of two joints. And um, these papers were accepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I got four papers in a rather short time. And coming back to the community, you were new to the cast science community. I was, I was yes. entirely new and the interesting point is actually I started with nothing. I didn't know anything about cars, I didn't know anything about precipitation, crystal physics of, of that way. And I started, and in, we had in the library a section of speleology, which was from the old states library. And this section was good, there were the books of Berkeley in for Marjorie Sweeting, mm -hmm. and those were really important books to me. There was Science of Speleology, which was an edition where you had the chemistry, and from there I started and I found the ways to, to look into it and the papers were accepted but in, in Germany actually there was no reaction. 
In the university, I was attacked by the Social Democratic Power Party as doing something stupid like, like cave science. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, I was accepted because uh, people like Stoffels and uh, those people in the Sauerland, mm -hmm. they knew I was a professor, I was interested in physics of speleology, and they showed me the caves. Okay. So I owe them a lodge in the Sauerland. That's yeah. the first hand experience you got there. Yeah. Basically. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, so far there was nothing. Mm -hmm. But like, let's say those established researchers, mainly from, I don't know, US, US, Canada, and so on. At that How time, at that, this was yeah. later, this was later. At that time, I was doing some work with uh, Herbert B. Franke. We did two papers, uh, I did one with Lambrecht where I did the first uh, simulation of stalagmites. The shapes of the stalagmites, yes. This was yeah. published in Die Höhle, mm -hmm. and there was a second one with Franke, where we looked for the uh, close rate independence on trip rate and stuff like that. But this was published in the Höhle, so it was not really perceived yeah. internationally. My next step into the community was, I needed some help and uh, some professional people, and from the German Research Foundation, mm -hmm. there was a Schwerpunkt. A priority program. A priority yeah. uh, thing, uh, which is uh, established for six years, mm -hmm. and it was on hydrogeochemistry in the Vados and phreatic zone of aquifers, had a long title. And I just called there the manager and said, Listen, that's what I'm doing, and I think that fits into your uh, topics, and I would like to join. Okay. And he was a little bit embarrassed because he didn't know me. And I said, where are you working? What is your field work? I said, I don't have any field work. Mm -hmm. I'm just working in the lab. Mm -hmm. He said, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then he said, okay, this was at that time possible. Would not be nowadays. He said, okay, we have a meeting. You have 10 minutes. So try to just present something. Tell us what you are doing. Convince and, us. And then, so I went there. I had my talk. And then they asked me to apply. Okay. And this was where I started into the DFG. But at that time, I was advised, do not talk on cast. Cast was not a word which was introduced word, yeah, at yeah, that okay. time. Yeah. And uh, but then I, I did uh, together with Buman, who did incredibly good work. That was your first student. Basically. This was my first okay. student in cast. Mm -hmm. He did uh, the. Uh, experiments uh, which were tedious uh, and long taking. Uh, he did the theory. I had established already a, a basic theory mm -hmm. and uh, the concept was there, but he did incredibly he good work. Yeah. And then later we did uh, more things on uh, theoretical, on turbulent flow and things like that. And okay, and um, yeah, this was accepted. And then uh, I met Ustovsky from Göttingen, from Göttingen okay. and I was accepted. I'm, people found this work interesting. There was uh, Horst Schulz, mm -hmm. uh, he was later in Bremen. And uh, we were in a wine cellar in Neustadt on the Weinstraße, in a monastery where we had the meetings and we were sitting there, they had good wine and it was a relaxed atmosphere. So I went and saw Ostrovsky sitting together with a guy who was Wolfgang Engel, the editor of Springer. Okay. And I joined them, we talked together, and then uh, Ostrovsky said, Wolfgang. Uh, I looked at him, Wolfgang. But he meant, uh, the he other meant Engel. Okay. And he said, Wolfgang, listen, Dreibrot has done a lot of very interesting things. He should write a book on that. Oh, this was the, and the inception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then he said, okay, you know, Tripod is reliable and he will do it and you don't have to fear anything, just let him do it. Okay. And then we talked a little about, mm -hmm. uh, and said, okay, we should put it into a Springer series because this is bought by the libraries. And then we changed and did something else. Okay. And in the next morning, actually, I looked for Engel and he was gone and I said, that's it. And then a day later, I got a message, can you make a first oh, draft the, yeah, of the yeah. content? So I did that. It was accepted and I got a contract. I didn't ha have written anything. Okay. And this was good because this motivates. It, it, yeah, and it then, a bit. Yeah, and no. then I had to learn about cost because now I, my idea was actually uh, to get rid of this descriptive, like 
there's a joint penetrable by water, whatever this means. This has a meaning. It's a joint, it has an aperture width, it has a width, and uh, there's a hydraulic weight in the long end, and I tried to put all those things. So the book was actually, I had to have a chapter on the basic physics. So Chemistry. the book, which then kind of opened your way into the cast community completely, eh, I would say. Yeah, it not also it. helped you recollect all your thoughts and all the knowledge of yeah, cast. Yeah, so yeah. it was not just you presenting, so it was also very good for you to, to learn. To learn. Yeah. You may, it was a filtering of present knowledge by Dreibrot mm -hmm. in a way to put the important things into okay. it. Yeah, yeah. And in a way I was like, you know, a cow coming to a green pasture where nobody had eaten anything. Mm -hmm. So this was very easy. And, and writing the book in English helped you to get established in the international community, or? Uh, later, yeah. I was writing that book and uh, It was published 88, but before mm -hmm. we had already published uh, those very important papers uh, on uh, limestone and calcite dissolution kinetics. With Boomer? In the old yeah. closed with Boomer and some other papers. Okay. So this was the basis because all this is also in the book. Mm -hmm. So we were quite advanced. Um, and so the publications were there. So in a way, they had perceived me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, I asked for a journey, the travel to the United States. Okay. And there I met Palmer. Art Palmer, yeah. I yeah. met Ron Kirbo in the Cosbet Cavern, okay. Will White, okay. yeah. Ralph Ewers. And I did a travel, Mama's Cave and Carlsbad and all that. And uh, Palmer at that time told me, listen, we were a little bit troubled because there was a guy Treibrot. Nobody knew his name. Nobody knew where he was coming from, and then we realized he did all the work we should have done. So okay. my perception was in the United States, not in Germany. And uh, then later I had this first uh, meeting in 1988 in Berlin, okay. where I had already presented my book. Actually, I had two copies there, which were both stolen, <laughs> found many copies in China. and. Uh, Derek Ford was there, and this in a way opened up okay. my, my reputation in, in, the, in the international community. community. Okay. Yeah. So then you were more and more immersed into the car science or yeah. cave science, yeah. and you were working in a way parallel in several topics, in limestone dissolution kinetics, precipitation kinetics, in modeling of uh, early formation of uh, karst aquifers and so on. Uh, so, how did that work? How did that... Yeah, as I told you, I started, I started with precipitation and then I realized that precipitation and dissolution is the same chemical process, positive or Just negative. Opposite side, yeah. and, I, I, uh, uh, and I always had an idea, how do caves arise? And the problem was that at that time everybody used a single fracture, at the first step, one dimension, and uh, the kinetics so far known was all a linear kinetics. Okay. And with linear kinetics, you just get a dissolution at the entrance and you don't get caves. And then there were some papers, uh, it was an experimental paper, uh, I forgot the name now, uh, I think it, uh, uh, and in that paper there was a suggestion that possibly close to equilibrium there should be a switch from linear kinetics to nonlinear kinetics. Mm -hmm. And later on there was a paper by Will White where he used uh, second order kinetics and showed that with the second order kinetics you have that the penetration of dissolution goes deep into the thing. Mm -hmm. And that actually brought me to the idea to use this kinetics. And then uh, I did this first uh, model of uh, yeah, breakthrough. Okay. I did this with the Commodore. Uh, it worked quite nice and um, yeah, okay. But in order to have a good and reliable data on kinetics, you then did a lot of work on the solution kinetics for, uh, just for only... Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Was, this was the work with Boomer actually. And then later with and, the and, Svensson, uh, and, and then, then I did already the calculations with nonlinear kinetics, which Palmer He used the original data of Plummer, Wigley and Parkhurst and he found that there is a switch uh, to a fourth order kinetics. 
and I used this. Okay. And then I did the first models and they're already published in the book. And then in a way I stopped on it and they okay, not, not really good. And uh, then probably I saw I should publish something and I published this first thing in Journal of Geology. Mm -hmm. And it was reviewed at that time by Derek Ford and Palmer. And both reviews were in favor. Also they had some critics. And so it was published there. And then, a parallel, we worked on the linear kinetics part. So, Buhmann and I did uh, a, a theoretical work on uh, dissolution and turbulent flow, which is very important for later things. And then we looked for the uh, influence of foreign ions mm -hmm. and things like that. And of course, we did also experiments on the dissolution, I told you already, mm -hmm. and we did experiments on precipitation. We put water to a small piece of uh, glass and then measured weight increase and found quite reasonable at that. This was all published in 1985. Mm -hmm. And then I decided uh, we should do something about the nonlinear kinetics. So Svensson, who came to me in, well, I don't know, late, late, middle, middle, middle 80s, mm -hmm. uh, he then started to do the, uh, the uh, nonlinear work. And at the same time, we had an excellent technician, um, which was uh, Jürgen Laugner, and he did most of the experimental setup, mm -hmm. and he was ingenious. And uh, yeah, that's uh, how it worked on. And after that, actually, I stopped the solution and, uh, in, on those fractures, and the point was that we had found out that, and this was important, that the dissolution rates depend on the width of the fracture or otherwise on the volume to surface ratio. Yeah. And then I started to do those experiments in batch experiments. So we did precipitation and dissolution in batch experiments. And the big question at that time was that uh, the conversion of CO2 mm -hmm. uh, to uh, carbonate is the rate limiting step. Okay. So I wanted okay. to do something about that, and then I used carbonic anhydride, which is an enzyme which uh, yeah. rapidly enhances the reaction. Mm -hmm. And we did a batch experiment, which usually to get to equilibrium took hours, and then we did it with carbon anhydrase, and it went within minutes. Okay. And so this was then the proof. The proof. And yeah. there was another point on that. Um, that we, we use different different limestones and the the parameters like the order also are different on different limestones. And we had the idea that this is due to perturbations and uh, Impurity. impurities yeah. on the yeah. surface. And then we did this experiment. Uh, we took a fresh limestone and put it to Auger spectroscopy and we could look for the impurities. Okay. And we found basically it's kaolinit, aluminium, which is there, mm -hmm. and it's on the surface. And the point is, at the beginning the rates are slow, but then if the solution proceeds, uh, all those um, impurities are collected. I mm -hmm. call this the dirty snow, 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 you know, when yeah. snow evaporates, yeah. mm -hmm. the, impurities stay there and we, we could show that with, uh, uh, with Auger spectroscopy. And we also did some experiments uh, in, uh, in precipitation mm -hmm. at that time and then actually it stopped. And then I went more and more into a modeling, into the modeling with Franchi but, and with Dushman. But coming back to the precipitation, you have also worked on natural streams. Yeah, yeah. So you started somewhere yeah, in, yeah. in the Harz Mountains on the yeah, that, west of yeah. the... That's what happened uh, actually with Ostrovsky. Ostrovsky told me that they made a little seminar at that stream where they put his students there as a practicum okay. and they measured chemistry of this spring. And it was a heavily calcite depositing spring, one could see this. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I mean, basically, couldn't we measure it here? So we made little designs to have little marble, marble tablets, which were hauled at the edge, so they were free in the water, and put water drink, was yeah. flowing along, yeah. then we could put them into the stream, mm -hmm. and we left them in for, for several weeks, and then we measured uh, the increase of weight, and this way we could uh, 
get the precipitation rates. Okay. And we found that the precipitation rate could be only explained if you uh, use, uh, if you take into account turbulent flow. Okay. And we had the theory on that. Mm -hmm. So this was the first step. And these work also led you to China. Uh, no, 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 not mm, yeah, not directly, yeah, but indirectly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was known now internationally uh, because in 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 uh, Budapest there was uh, the first meeting, and Derek Ford in his introductory talk, I wasn't there, I missed it, said, "Okay, one of the big highlights in 1988 is the Book of Dreibrot." Mm -hmm. And so I went into uh, uh, international conferences, and one was in. Yulin, the first, and there I presented my um, cave model things. And then two years later I was invented by Tao Xiang uh, in this International Geographic Correlation Project mm -hmm. and we did a big, big journey, four weeks through, G through so China, China, once in your life travel, it was fantastic. And we came to Wang Long, which is this huge uh, uh, Travertine depositing mm -hmm. river, two kilometers long, uh, 500 meters elevation. Mm -hmm. And there I found a little leaf, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a rhododendron leaf, mm -hmm. in the water. Okay. And this leaf was, had a crust, uh, it's here somewhere. Yep, yep. I, we can show it later. Uh, it, it had a crust of calcite, which quite, was quite about one, crust. one yeah, this is a part of it, yeah. which was about one millimeter thick. Mm -hmm. And I turned the leaf, now it's brown, it was green. Okay, still fresh. So I said, this is heavily calcite precipitation. And I was thinking, couldn't we do those experiments here? This would be nice, they would be in days and so. And I talked to Johan Tao Xiam and said, listen, we did experiments in Germany. And this is a perfect place to do such experiments. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, that's fine. Uh, he also was striving for international uh, contacts because at that time China was just starting to open. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he asked his student, uh, Liu Sagua, to do the experiments. So I, in detail, set up the experiment, put all the equipment, sent it to China. Are you prepared it in Germany and then send it? I prepared everything in Germany, okay. the yeah. market, and mm -hmm. then how to put the, then the, 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 the marble tablets and the, uh, the fixtures of them, everything was there. And uh, Leo did it, and the experiment, the results were fantastic. Okay. Yeah. And then we decided to go there one, one, month, uh, one year later and did a second campaign, which in a way failed because it was rainy and there was, was mixing of glacial rivers and so. Mm -hmm. so Areas where you had heavy deposition at that time had no deposition at all, okay. but others had. And we published this in uh, uh, GCR. Mm -hmm. And for, for the Chinese, this was a big breakthrough. And later on, they did a lot of work of the early uh, these travertine depositing springs in oh, China. Yeah. So, in following or parallel to precipitation, you were more and more focusing also to the modeling of. Uh, early spallogenesis, particularly starting with one-dimensional uh, fracture, going to the two-dimensional networks. So how can you say something more about how this work progressed yeah, in after, time? After I had published the first paper on the one-dimensional fracture in the Journal of Geology, mm -hmm. uh, I got a, a, a letter from Chris Groves. And he was the first actually who did uh, two-dimensional uh, nets. And uh, he uh, said thank you to me and your work has inspired me so much. And he invited me to the States. So I first learned Mummy's Cave there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I got ideas of his two-dimensional work. And at the same time I was uh, to, to find a better way to do my, my my theoretical uh, calculations. So then I said, okay, probably a two-dimensional net is more realistic. And I gave a proposal to the uh, DFG and got a position. And then this was occupied by Jörg Simos. And he um, did the first uh, calculations on two-dimensional nets. 
Like if we made the nets in this way, that we put a net just statistically, and then we looked for all the percolating pathways which are in there, and all the blind ones we took out. And then we had a lot of parameters, we had the uh, occupation probability of it fracture and things like that and he did this modeling and it was quite successful. Derek Ford actually liked it, he said it's also very good for teaching. Mm -hmm. So this was the first two-dimensional work which we started and uh, okay and after that time uh, when this should be increased, um, Franchi came in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing Franchi was doing was he did all our calculations, all the programs, he was writing from scratch again, everything. And it worked nicely and we were correct. And then we started in all kind of uh, scenarios, we looked what mixing corrosion could do inside, or if you have a CO2 source inside, if you have changing boundary conditions, and all things like that. We also went uh, from uh, the horizontal two-dimensional, uh, idea to a vertical one where we had a water table and we did a lot of scenario and uh, correspondingly quite a lot of publications. And before uh, I had done um, uh, this equation which we used later on and I had also done, uh, showed mathematically uh, the basics of the one dimensional fracture. I was writing that in a hospital after I had an a incident in the cave where I always uh, I yeah, got killed because I fell down a little, a little fracture, fell down a little something like that, and was stuck by the helmet. Okay. So it's so like a hang up, yeah. and uh, my my spinal disc exploded, went into the cord, and they had to be operated. And I was for three weeks in the hospital. At that time, I was writing this paper, and uh, this is uh, okay. I mean, it's actually a little bit out of fashion because the. F the uh, two-dimensional fracture and the dissolution kinetics is not so really important mm -hmm. in the two-dimensional net. And the two-dimensional net actually is the breakthrough because there the breakthrough times and the evolution times become much shorter, which we realized, but we, I, didn't, I never did really understand it. And then after we had stopped for quite a while, we did some other things. We went back to this and we looked uh, in some scenarios and those kind, what they call wormholes, and how they compete within each other, and did a lot of scenarios, and now we have understand how they work. So, considering one-dimensional fracture, uh, your contribution, your major contribution was the 1997 Water Resources Research yeah. paper, where you presented analytical approach to uh, to its evolution. How did you come to that? The classical term, yeah. the breakthrough term. Yeah. How did I come to that? Uh, I just tried to find a, a mathematical der derivation on the mechanism, which is a feedback mechanism. And then I looked for the equation and somehow there were some equations and finally you got a differential equation or a differential integral equation and when you solved that you found, uh, you, you just could derive the breakthrough times. So it was, you know, going mathematically through it and uh, then it was in accordance with the modeling and that was what we did. And uh, later on then actually we stopped this one-dimensional stuff and we went to the two-dimensional and that's basically where first Franchi came in and did the first two-dimensional things and also the vertical uh, aquifer with water table. And shortly uh, when Franchi had finished, Dushko came in, Dushko Romanov, and he continued, and without those two, nothing would have been happened. So all what I have done, they have done as well. And the merits go equally, as they go to me, they go to them. Okay, and from this two-dimensional modeling, there was a group evolving, you call them the Tübingen workshops, yeah. basically. How does that fit into all into okay. the story? Yeah, this, this happened uh, within uh, the framework of the Schwerpunktprogramm in the DFG. I somehow got into contact with Martin Sauder, who was also participating, and uh, he, he told me what they were doing, and it was in a way uh, similar, at least the topic. They had a double porosity model. Mm -hmm. At that time, we didn't have that. We did that later by having very small fractures as the second porosity. 
And uh, he invited me, they, they did a workshop, at that time they were in Tübingen. And so we started with a workshop, actually uh, the Bremen people, Duschko, uh, Franchi and me, and then uh, the people of Tübingen. This was Martin Teutsch, uh, Martin Sauter, Teutsch, and Lidl, Bauer, yeah. and all those people who were working there. And we met every year in, in uh, uh, the, uh, the guest house of the university. And it was very pleasant and we had good discussions. And finally we, we developed a benchmark model, uh, which was just a net with one single fracture disturbing it. And this was done with all the different models with all the same results. And at that time I realized that there was a guy, uh, somehow I don't know, I got in contact with him, uh, in Australia, this was you, Gimmo Kaufmann, yes. and I invited you because you did similar work. And so we had for five or six years, as long as this uh, Sonderforschungsbereich was working in, in Tübingen, we had these meetings every year and they were really good and they were helping to push up things and to get forward. And later on then, when everybody was successful, uh, Martin Sauder went to Göttingen, Lidl to Dresden, and all the others went somewhere, and then this broke apart. I would they changed. maybe at this point to also people from Neuchâtel, Laszlo Kirali, Yariv Janin, Natila Kovac, who were also there, and actually they were the one who somehow contributed the practical side. You yeah, know? We, yeah. we were just within our malls and they yeah. actually wanted to somehow to, yeah. to make the knowledge transfer yeah. 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 from this aquifer yeah. modeling or devolution yeah. modeling to yeah. real properties. And this made, this made actually connections to Neuchâtel. Uh, Kirali invited me uh, to Neuchâtel and later on I was invited to a, a, a lecture which I was giving for three hours in an afternoon. Okay. And then when I was finished, I said, okay, that's finished now. And then this converted into a big party. And all kinds of people from Switzerland, from Cables were there. This was very nice. And uh, there were good discussions. And this was an important point to also have contact to people who do real things, not <laughs> something etheric as we did on the computers. Then there was another line of research, basically, the stalagmites. So the uh, opposite story. You, your work was very crucial at that time for understanding of their growth. Can you tell us a bit about the key yeah. results, basically, yeah. of the stalagmites? Yeah, we have this sample yeah, yeah. which you have lined. With, with the stalagmites, the first thing to put forward, how it came to that, to this modeling. I mean, we did modeling, modeling the shape, independence on trip rate and on things like that. And uh, I didn't know how to do it. And then I had this little stalagmite, which I found in a cave in Mallorca, which was at the side of a road. Mm -hmm. It's a small cave, it was heavily decorated, and this was split in this way. And if you look at it, you see uh, the lines of the angular lines, and then you see these crystals, which in a way are always perpendicular to the present surface, which is trivial. Mm -hmm. But at that moment I had to look, I mean, that's what you have to do. You just look for the water which flows down, then the dissolution rates decline by some way. I put an exponential there. Yes. And then you just have to make the growth perpendicular to it. And that's, uh, we, we calculated that at these computers in 90, uh, this was in 1980 with, uh, with uh, Günther Lambrecht. And uh, this was, you know, you get the print out of papers like that and with, with Hollowit cards. And then we, we got the first results. But the problem was that actually we had something artificial in that. What we were saying is the water drips, flows down, and in the flow uh, it declines uh, exponentially. The decrease, yeah. Franke, who did similar things later yeah. on, said no, it's, it's a two dimensional uh, thing. It should be like exponent minus x squared through something. And he did calculations like that. So and I looked yeah. into that, I found the conditions, which kind of decline can you take to get something. And then we had the idea to say, let's do the physics. And uh, this was inspired by the work of Short, because they had done stalactites. Mm -hmm. And they had done the stalactite. I always wanted to do the stalactite. I never had an idea how to do it. And they had the idea, and it was so simple. It was my work with Buman, mm -hmm. which tells you that 
distribution rates decline with the depth precipitation the rates. Of the precipitation yeah. dissolution yeah. with, with the depth of the of the layer. and that's what they used. Mm -hmm. And they could perfectly model find the model uh, the ideal state of a stalactite. And then I said you have to do something like that. and they use flow. Mm -hmm. So I said okay. We have water which comes there, we have a circular thing, we know what circular flow, laminar flow is, and then we calculated the flow, then we knew the time which the was needed, mm -hmm. and we knew the precipitation kinetics in time. Mm -hmm. So we did this, Dushku did all the programming, it was tedious, and uh, what we finally found out was that this the shapes of the stalagmites were extremely similar to what Franke had done to the exponent, to the uh, square exponential one. And uh, so we, we, we published this in GCA. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was a paper which did uh, isotopes on it. Mm -hmm. And they used the simple Rayleigh equation, which is a simple equation uh, which can easily be used. And we said, okay, we know how long the water has been there and we know how much calcite it has deposited and the isotopic ratio is just the ratio of the actual calcite which is in the solution left and the initial calcite mm -hmm. uh, to an exponential of something very small 0 0.00 something the uh, this is the, mm -hmm. the fractionation factor mm -hmm. and so we did that and we could and we had experimental data uh, this was from Mikler and we could explain those data. This were the Bahamas mm -hmm. data where they deposited in a cave onto uh, glass plates, I guess. No, no, he, he, looked for, he looked for a lot of stalagmites from the literature mm -hmm. and he found out that most of the stalagmites deposited was out, uh, out of the isotopic equilibrium and then there were other where they put uh, little uh, tiles on top of a stalagmite yeah, yeah. and measured how uh, the, uh, the dis mm -hmm. uh, dissolution rates or deposition rates are distributed from the center. And this where actually the, where I got the ideas from to do that. And then after uh, I had seen what they were doing, I was not so sure they're okay. And I tried to do an alternative way of understanding this uh, uh, fractionation of um, Isotopes. isotopes yeah. And I had the idea that it's actually the kinetics. In the dissolution kinetics we had two entities. First is the kinetic constant and the second is the equilibrium concentration. Mm -hmm. And then it's clear for the two different isotopes this must be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I looked for the kinetics of those two isotopes and then could calculate. And I got an equation which of course is not easy to, uh, it gives the same results as these Rayleigh results in the beginning. Because it's only a linear thing and you can fit whatever equation you take. If it is sometimes slowly at the beginning, you can fit it and you get some kind of parameter. Okay. But you have to understand the parameters and this is the problem. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, what you were telling, the, the, the isotopic story with respect to the, um, to the Spello teams, um, this was already in, during your time, af after your active time as a professor, yeah, yeah. in your retirement period. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you never have really retired, no, officially no, no, in 2004, no. but uh, uh, in principle for the last 16 years you have still been active. No, I did a lot of work. First, I, I actually went into this business of uh, iso rare isotopes, and uh, in a way this was difficult. I did a paper in 2008 where I used this kinetic model, mm -hmm. and um, well, this was accepted by the community, that means they cited it. But I don't think many people have really read it. And uh, the problem was then that there was, in a way, it was very, very difficult. Uh, the community which works on those proxies, they take the proxies and then, yeah, I don't know what they do, I have never understood it. They, they use statistics and somehow out of it read climate. And uh, this is strange because sometimes a stalagmite is a proxy for temperature, sometimes it's a, uh, it's a proxy for water and I never have understood why does this stalagmite is a proxy for temperature and the other for water and the third for that and so on. And I realized that the idea what the physics is on this 
was never perceived by people. They, they had just things like uh, there is outgassing of CO2. They did not really know what the outgassing of CO2 was. Also, we had done experiments on stalagmites. We had experiments where a water film is running down a flat plate. And then you can either measure dissolution, which I did with you mm -hmm. for dissolution, uh, in that paper which we published where you revisited uh, the uh, theory of Buhmann mm -hmm. and you uh, verified it, which was nice. Yeah, numerically, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and we did this experiment, we published this. And this tells really what happened, what the, what the physics and the chemistry is, but it was not it was not realized. People didn't read it, I don't know. There is still that there are gradients and you have all kinds of degassing enhanced and, and there are about 10 different terms of degassing which are nowhere defined. Physically defined. And uh, uh, well, I published a few papers right now which I hope will fix the things mm -hmm. and there are two papers which have been published the one by Gu, actually he uses our old model mm -hmm. and uh, does the isotopes, includes the isotopes and gets the same result as we got, so this has been verified two times. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, okay. And then uh, I did work in, uh, in Mainz, which failed because there were controversies between the people there and myself in, with respect to others and with respect to the physics and in a way I was pushed out. And I looked at their results and uh, I published from their results now uh, quite strong evidence that my model is correct. And so maybe this will probably give some progress. Mm -hmm. But I was not interested in the proxies at them. I was interested to find out what are the signals which come in. And there's a lot of signals which are in the cave, which do not have anything to do with climate, mm. and they can be large. Mm. And you never know what in your time series comes from climate and from this. So it's difficult to separate. It's basically. very, very yeah. difficult to separate. People know it in a way, but still, you know, those proxies aren't done. And if you have done it on stalagmite there, you go to another place in the world because you have to prove teleconnections. And mm. so there is a lot of work done, one stalagmite after that, the other all are the same, yeah, that's factory nowadays. There was another line of research after your retirement on the porosity of uh, government platforms. Ah, yeah, that's what we did with uh, Dushko and the other one with Fungi. I got um, from, at that time it was ELF, now it's Total. Okay. This company, and they have their research center in France in Pau. And they were interested on evolution of porosities in carbonate uh, um, platforms, which are low down, and those are in Kazakhstan, the big, big, big oil fields. And they wanted to, uh, to know how this possibly could evolve. So they asked me whether I could do modeling on it. Actually, we had no idea on it, how <laughs> to do it. And we had old papers of John Milroy and things like that, freshwater lenses. And we started in there and then finally we got a good idea how to do it and we did a paper which was tedious computer work and uh, Dushku did this all, painstaking long calculations and we were able to show where the uh, evolution is. It's at the border between the freshwater lens and the saltwater mm -hmm. lens mm -hmm. and only there. And we could say how, what is the rate of increase of porosity at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do it then later on, but then Total stopped this thing. This was for two or three years. And yeah, we published this. And then uh, at that time I was in the Bahamas, I had seen the porous rocks there, which are entirely different from everything you know in the Alps, because it's sandstone, there have no fractures. And, um, and it's the same as in Florida. And in Florida, I, I, I had contact with Lee Floria, mm. which I met in this uh, conference in the Bahamas in... Uh, uh, okay, some of the islands. Mm. Uh, and uh, we, there are caves, or isolated caves in, in, uh, in Florida, which do not have entrances or exits. Of course, nowadays they have, 
And uh, so I looked into those and we had the idea there is a large aquifer below and then water comes in from the top, mm -hmm. from a lake also, and you have mixing corrosion, just where the joints are. Mm -hmm. And then you get what they call transversal spelagenesis, mm -hmm. and this comes from the confluence of two waters which mix. Mm -hmm. And so we did quite a lot of nice calculations on that. This was uh, published and we gave this at a conference in, in Vienna. In, in, no, not in Vienna, in, uh, in, in, in Darmstadt. In, in, no, this was the other one. We gave this at a conference in, in, in where was this? Spanish conferences? In Malaga. In Malaga, yeah. right. In Malaga. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and later on, then we had the idea how uh, we could probably calculate the intrusion of pollutants. And Franchi had a perfect idea to program. We put a lot of particles into the computer and then we looked how they statistically evolve and we did this on, on uh, cast nets in the different states of evolution mm -hmm. and we published this, this was also in Malaga mm -hmm. and uh, it was also in Darmstadt where we, uh, it was published. Mm -hmm. So this was some work but it was in the outgoing and then of course uh, we did the book, the new book which um, was actually uh, the people from Po were interested in Franchi thesis which was uh, the first dimension, one-dimensional, with many, many scenarios. And they came to a, a conference in Postojna, and we wanted to give the book to them, and it was gone. It was sold out. And then we had, then we had the idea to, to make a second edition. Mm -hmm. And then we started, and then we realized we had so many things done and so many things to do, so actually, uh, there was first a revision, a revision of Franchi's book and then we started in all the kind of scenarios in two-dimensional nets. And we did this together with Stuchu, with Franchi, and a lot of work was done in Postojna. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting upstairs, I was sitting in the apartment downstairs. And so I was thinking about the scenarios which could be done. And Franchi started to calculate them and then we interacted. And this was a very, very good time. Very productive time. Uh, and uh, this, uh, yeah. yeah and it the, was always fantastic when I was in Postojna because I had there the caves, the people in the institute were so friendly. Mm -hmm. And I was shown the caves and the, the landscape of, of, of Slovenia. So I, I loved that time. Okay, welcome. And the tubing meetings then resulted in a second book. Can you tell us a bit about the background of this book? Yeah, actually, the Turing meetings firstly resulted in a lot of new scenarios which we have done. Uh, the Turing people also, so there was a lot of material which was published someplace. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the idea sometimes to, to have it all together, but uh, didn't think really on it. And then in uh, this conference in Postojna, uh, there were people from Poor. Uh, total, they had called me before and they were interested in uh, evolution of caves and because to find uh, oil in, in porous medium. They came to Tübingen and then they asked for Franchi's thesis, to which was pub uh, to, to Postojna, which was published, um, and we didn't have any more copy. And then we had the idea okay, there's interest in the book of uh, Franchi, we should do a second edition. And we had in this time all new material, and then this was delayed. And later on, then finally, we had the idea we do it now. So systematically, we took the old things which we had and put new scenario together. Mm -hmm. And this was done with Dusko and um, in Bremen. And I remember I was in in a, in a hospital, and uh, we did. Uh, I was writing on that book and. Front, uh, Dishko did a lot of calculations and then he sent by mail uh, small disks mm -hmm. which I could see on the computer and later on I was also in Postojna and uh, worked with Franchi on that so after a while we had something which was fitting nicely together and then we had the idea of KM and this was tubing people and in a way they had contributed also to what we had done mm -hmm. so we invited the group of Tübingen, that means Martin Salter's group, and then of course Georg Kaufmann, who had done similar sim uh, simulations, 
and had done them all the time during the workshop uh, to write kind of review article on their work and we would publish it then in the book. Mm. And then, okay, the book was published and it was done in Slovenia very effectively. If you had done it by Springer, <laughs> it never would have worked or we would have to pay a lot of money. And it was successful and it's available now. It's in research gate, everybody can do it can download it. Okay. So continuing from the models, I would more uh, shift to the section which more deals with, let's say, philosophy of what we are doing. Eh? And models of spelogenesis, for example, well, they are not really calibrated. We have some observation in, in nature, or qualitative, and we compare models and what we see in the nature. So, or, what is really the use of them? Uh, why do you think they are important? Yeah, okay, I mean, the, first you have to define what a model is. I would say there are hard models, which is engineering, science. So if an engineer built the bridge, he first does a model of the bridge with hard natural science laws, and then the bridge is built, and usually this model works. This is on the one side, the hard models. On the other side, there are soft models, which are models on uh, very complex structures with very many interactions, which are not completely known. Then you can build a model. This model needs many parameters. And in a way from this model, you can learn maybe what could happen. And uh, with respect to our modeling, what the idea of our model was to do a model which in a way include the basic principles, not all of them because you don't know them, the basic principles. And if you know the basic principles, you can change them in the model and you can see how they interact. Mm -hmm. So actually the purpose of our models were to learn on cost processes and not uh, to give uh, exact breakthrough times and things like that. I don't think this is possible with such models. So it's understanding basically. For understanding, understanding the behavior and this has been useful uh, to do this and it had a wide, wide realm. I mean we did this in porous media, we did it in, in fractured media and uh, in a way uh, it also I mean, look for mixing corrosion. There were ideas on what mixing corrosion could do. Mm -hmm. I think we do understand better now what, what it yeah. does. So this is the ideas of this model. Yeah. So we continue a little bit more on general, not so related to cars, but related to your long career in science and research. Uh, during your career, actually in your uh, later stage of career, uh, you were hit by the digital revolution. And how did you respond to it? Or uh, do you see what are the positives and negative sides of, uh, you know, that we are now all connected uh, via... Yeah, okay, via. I mean, the digital revolution is the end or a, a stage of the development which we have now. But uh, the digital revolution has started slowly. I mean, the internet for scientists was available, you could get everything 10 years ago or so. So it was already hitting me. The problem now with the information, you get information easily, mm -hmm. but you are drowned by a lot of information. And the problem with the digital revolution in a way is that we get so many information which we first cannot grasp, it's too much. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we cannot really say what's true and what's not true, so we, we lose any kind of orientation. And this uh, has changed science completely. Let me give an example. When I started, if I had the internet and I would have taken my information from the internet, I never would have been able to do what I have done. Because those few important papers which were important for me would have gone lost in the noise of the many, many mediocre papers. And that's what uh, in science happens. And this has a deep impact to science. That means nowadays we have a science factory. Everybody grasps a little bit of information and then somehow it's put together. There is no really context between the things. And there's a lot of paper published with many, many authors on it. Mm -hmm. 
And each of the authors does not know the whole paper, probably one who has written the PhD, and it's increasing and increasing. And with this responsibility is taken away, if you have 10 authors in a paper, who is responsible? Mm -hmm. And I have had experience, I was asking authors for questions, and the leading author was out, and then I asked the other ones, and nobody of them could react. They always said, okay, they asked the leading one. This is just an example. And in a way, this spoils science. And we have now a system, it's kind of self-organized mafia. The student comes in there, he gets a PhD thesis, clear what he has to do. Mostly the results are also <laughs> written in it. And then he starts to do it. One expect you have to do two or three publications. So he has to work like a madman and he has no time uh, really to be careful. Einstein said, if you do science, you have to work hard and you have to be ready after you have done all the work to throw it away when you find out it's dubious. Mm -hmm. And this no more happens. Yeah. Everything is published. It's not the content which is important, it's just the publishing record and that is what in a way perverts science and I'm, a, I'm just helpless. I see that and uh, you cannot fight against it because you're not hurt. Mm. The, dog, the dog barks and the car run goes on. Mm. Recently, uh, the president of the Max Planck uh, Gesellschaft has said uh, a man like Stefan Heil, who is a Nobel Prize winner, never would have a chance nowadays because he has no big publication record, because he was on one idea mm. which he finally finished and won the Nobel Prize. And there were not many publications like that. But nowadays, we need urgently men like him. So this, you already answered my thoughts or questions on scientific ethics, because this is closely related to it. And uh, the scientific ethics is, well, we are all steering between careers, publishing and the ethical principles which we have. And, uh, I'm afraid that this is going to be even more challenging in the future. Yeah, I mean, there is no discussion in ethics, because in this system, uh, there, as I told, there is no responsibility. There is this big pressure, and it's, you just publish something. There is no, no critics on it, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit helpless, I, I told you. And ethics is going lost, because for me, ethics is you have really to do as good as you can and you have to be critical on yourself and you work, you all the time have to question, is this correct what I'm doing? And those things are no more done. And, and, and the second thing which is lost um, in, in this, I mean, it's all very short term, you have three or two projects and in this project you have to do something. If somebody has a good idea, he has no chance because if he is in a project, there are no means to do it, mm. and those ideas got, less, get lost. So also, you know, the real good ideas, and this makes a lot of the ethics and science to, to forward those good ideas are severely hindered. Okay. Yeah, I would take this as a take-home message for those who view this interview. So I would just conclude that uh, I have always been impressed by your passion and interest in solving scientific questions and you have passed this to us mm, very actively and I hope to some extent also successively but uh, and I still hope well that it stays so as long as possible. So thank you for, okay, thank for you. your time. Okay, thank you.